But I want us to realize that God is a God that will meet us exactly where we're at. So whether you're watching on your phone, on your laptop, on a TV, just know that we can welcome God's presence wherever it is that we are. We are the temple that God dwells in now. So let's welcome him, let's thank him, and just cry out how much we need him. Come on. Lord, I come. Lord, I come. I confess a bowing here. I find my rest without you. I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Lord, I Your grace is more Where grace is found Is where you are And where you are Lord, I am free Holiness is Christ in me Lord, I need you Stand or fall on you, Jesus. You're my hope and stay. So teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand or fall on. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God. Your only hope, come on, let's sing this out. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. But holy trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing that out again. My hope is built. 
my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name, Christ alone. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love, and through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seemed to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Through every high or stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love, and through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all, and He So 
God, thank you so much for being the cornerstone, for being the one that is always present everywhere we go. I just pray that we can make you our cornerstone and realize how much we need you. So Father, we look to you, the blood that you shed on the cross, the death that you died, the suffering that you endured on our behalf. So Father, we bow down to you in worship. We give you all that we are. And I pray that we can just be in constant community, constantly aware of your presence all around us. So God, open our ears, open our hearts, open our souls to what you will be speaking to us today. And I just pray over your people, every single person that is tuning in, that you bless them, that you bless their families, that you bless their children and their futures. So Father, thank you for being the cornerstone that our hope is found in Christ alone. And it is in Christ's holy, precious name that we pray all of these things. Everyone said, amen. You guys, enjoy the rest of the service. Akuo, it is so awesome to be spending time with you once again. Y'all, I am so fired up, as always, to be involved in these conversations with you based on the word that God has given to us this year to live out, which is ready. And the, the idea behind that is something that I know you know because you've been spending time with us all this year. We are ready right now, as currently constructed. We are ready to make an impact on this world. We are ready to listen to God to love people, to learn our purpose, and to link to our community. And in this series that we are in, we have been taking a look at what a second nature actually, how, how that lives out, right? How we can do all of these things by leaning on what Jesus has asked us to do, which is develop a second nature, develop the nature of Jesus, which you are ready for right now. You are ready to do things in your life to develop that nature of Jesus. And today we have a special guest joining us to help deliver that message. This week, her, we're, we have Des Laglu joining us, and she is a part of the Park Community Church. Des is the pastoral resident there, uh, which means that she will preach on Sundays, and then she will just fill in wherever it is that she might be needed uh, anytime throughout the week. In addition to that, I have known Des since we were both in high school, which was just like six years ago, right? We were just a little bit. Uh, but anyways, also my wife, uh, Lauren and I are godparents to one of her daughters, and so they are family to us. And here at Akul, you've probably crossed paths with her as well if you've gone to the Ladies Book Club. She's been helping lead that community group along with Victoria Aguilar and Daviana Garcia since the very beginning. So with that being said, I can tell you that I completely trust her to bring the word to you today. So without further ado, here is Desley Loglu. Good morning, Akuo. My name is Desley Loglu, and it is an honor to be with y'all today, talking about God and reading his true word. We're continuing in the sermon series, Second Nature, and I was gifted Matthew 7, 1 through 6 to read and reread, to ask God about, and to seek his guidance as to what he wanted me to share with y'all. And let me tell you, it was more like a wrestling match because I want to be in control and in charge more than I would like to admit or even realized. Matthew is the first book out of the four gospels that starts the New Testament in our Holy Bible. God's true word. These four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are records or accounts of Jesus, the Messiah, our Savior, his life and the events that took place as, we, as he was ministering in and around the Middle East, the Mediterranean, North Africa, that area of our planet. Today, we are digging into just six verses, but man, are these six verses overflowing with abundance. And I want to highlight overflowing with love. Love that only a good, all-powerful father could display to all of his kids over the expanse of time. I want to ask Humby and Abel for some help. We're going to have them read different translations of these six verses to us. And as they read them, 
I want to encourage each of us to sit back and allow God's word to cover us. Maybe God will raise the volume on a word or phrase that he wants you to take with you to continue to consider beyond today and throughout your weeks. Maybe it's a message that he's been whispering to you since before today. Maybe it's a new message that you just cannot shake. Let me say a quick prayer over us before our servant leaders read the scripture to us. Father, you are the questioner provoking me to dive deep into the mystery of who you are, who I am, and the life that we share together. I invite you, Abba, to speak, to ask, to search my heart, and to shape my life. Amen. All right, guys, this is Matthew 7, 1 through 6 from the New Living Translation. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is a standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls, then turn and attack you. This comes from the Message Translation, and this is Matthew 7, 1 through 6. Don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you, when your own face is distorted by contempt? It's this whole traveling roadshow mentality all over again, playing a holier-than-thou part instead of just living your part. Wipe that ugly sneer off your own face, and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. Don't be flip with the sacred, banter and silliness. Give no honor to God. Don't reduce holy mysteries to slogans. In trying to be relevant, you're only being cute and inviting sacrilege. When I have read this scripture before, it was always through the filter of a parent or person of authority scolding me, getting after me, kindly threatening me. I grew up in a Mexican household, so that kind threat is very real for me, right? God was saying, don't you judge or you're going to be judged. I was in trouble because for sure I had been judging others and for sure I will be judged too but I was always kind of grateful for this correction because I knew I was wrong for judging others and God's just keeping me on track. As I've grown in my relationship with God and read more scripture, I can see a little more of God's character. His nature is just a little more clear. God is a patient and kind dad. And as I was preparing this sermon and studying these six verses, I see what Jesus is communicating here it's different than I had understood before. Saints, God loves you. He loves you so much that his wise instruction is given and re-given and re-given with no sight of limitations. He's not disappointed in us. This section is not a scolding like how I had read it before. He loves us, wants the best for us, desires for us to live in a good and healthy, physical, spiritual, emotional life. He has rules and desires us to be obedient. And also, he is a God of deep reconciliation. He desires complete unity with each of us. He's a God of active pursuit of us, extending grace and mercy without keeping any record. He's lovingly reminding us, instructing us of the right way to live so that we can have the best lives now and be about his kingdom building work. And y'all, Jesus has jokes. When Jesus says, do not judge others and you will not be judged, refuse to be a critic full of bias towards others and you will not be judged. Don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless of course you want the same treatment. What he's pointing out is our heart attitude that is quick to accuse and condemn others without humility or gentleness. He's speaking against our critiques that we make without the desire to lovingly correct or restore the person. Jesus is commanding us to not be proud, and he's calling out our hearts 
that are quick to want to punish a person. This reveals in us a self-righteousness that is the opposite of Jesus. He is who we want to be more like. This brought to my mind the story that is found further into Matthew, further into Jesus' life. Chapter 26, verses 6 through 13. And this is when a woman comes into the home where Jesus and his friends have just finished eating dinner. And as the custom of Jesus' day was, he was reclining at the table, just talking with his friends. This woman walks into the home and up to Jesus. She proceeds to pull out a white alabaster jar that's the size of something like a cup and a half, which is 12 ounces. 12 ounces is like a soda can. And it is of pure nard. This is an expensive perfume at the time, and this woman proceeds to break the jar of perfume and pour the contents over Jesus' head. She's anointing him. Does she know why? Is she concerned about her timing? Is she even aware of her choice to anoint Jesus in someone's dining room? Scripture does not elaborate on the details of this woman's choice to anoint Jesus in the story, but I believe that this woman was following the instruction of God. She was anointing Jesus because God had prompted her to do this. God is providing for Jesus through this woman. You see, this incident is known as Jesus's anointing at Bethany. And according to the account in Matthew, it's the beginning of Jesus's fulfillment of his task, y'all, his purpose for all of us. He is the pure, spotless lamb being prepared, anointed here for slaughter, to be our atonement, our sinless substitute that makes each of us white as snow. This woman was doing the holy work of God by getting God's only begotten son, Jesus, anointed and ready for his death. So then, how did the disciples who were sitting around with Jesus, some maybe still eating their dinner, some reclining with him, respond? Did they slow clap in praise that their sister in the faith, what she did? Were they marveling at her obedience to sacrifice so lavishly for the one who was far deserving for it? No. Scripture says that when the disciples saw they were indignant. Indignant means like outraged. Matthew 26, eight through nine records their response. Why this waste, they asked. This might have been sold for a great deal and given to the poor. They were critics, full of bias toward their sister. Their heart attitudes were quick to accuse and condemn her without any humility or gentleness. It didn't matter that their idea to use the expensive perfume to help the poor was good. They were so proud that they thought they knew best before they even fully took in the whole scenario, before they could grasp even a portion of the story that was unfolding right before them. The disciples passed unjust judgment and condemnation on this woman. They told her she was wasting something, but Jesus was quick to lovingly inform everyone in that room because he was the only person who knew the whole story that what this woman had done was good work, that this was gonna be remembered throughout the ages. The disciples have heard Jesus tell them not to judge others many times before this, and still they acted rash, harsh, unjust, and gave this woman judgment. Pastor and author David Guzik explains Jesus's instruction not to judge like this. We break this command when we think the worst of others. We break this command when we only speak to others of their faults. We break this command when we judge an entire life only by its worst moments. We break this command when we judge the hidden motives of others. We break this command when we judge others without considering ourselves in their same circumstances. We break this command when we judge others without being mindful that we ourselves will be judged. Can I get an amen? So let's get to the, G the Jesus has jokes part, verses three and four. And why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? That was Matthew 7, three through four. The illustration of the plank and the speck was Jesus being so over the top ridiculous and obvious in order to prove his point, his example. This metaphor is Jesus making a joke. 
Jesus is communicating how far more tolerant we all are of our own sin than of the sin of others. He doesn't say, do not help your brother or sister. Jesus advises to help others. Just look at yourself first. Recognize your realistic shortcomings and your own sin. And then from a place of humility and compassion, you can actually be of true help. Another person's sin should grieve us for them. We should be concerned for them, truly caring for what is best for them. Our grief should instantly flow to compassion for that person, not anger, not frustration. This is also a reminder of how Jesus reacts to sin. He does not send fire and brimstone down on us, but he generously redirects us and shows love and compassion for us. I struggle with judging every day of my life. Some days are better than others, but do you know who I am most judgmental of? The people in their moments of most need. My first response is not compassion, but is more often than not anger and frustration. Oh man, to say that out loud breaks my own heart. I'm talking about the person standing in the hot sun at the traffic light asking for change. This is not a time, Des, to question that individual's life choices and to be a critic um, who is quick to accuse and condemn him or to want to know how they ended up on that current, in their current situation on the street corner. I'm talking about my sister or sister-in-law whose child has just acted disobedient and disrespectfully at a family function. You know the one, the massive meltdown right in the middle of everyone in the family because mama or dad said no to the lollipop right before dinner. This is not the time, Des, to be a critic full of bias towards my sister, judging her parenting techniques and quietly disapproving of my niece or nephew. Also, thinking, oh my gosh, my child never did that. That thought always sneaks into my brain too. Because the truth is, it does not matter what got a person to the traffic light corner asking for help. What matters is God asking me to extend relief, not judgment. It's not about my niece or nephew being spoiled and throwing a fit over candy. It's about unity, love, and obedience between my sister, her husband, and my niece or nephew. The truth is, I do not know what I'm doing as a parent either. And I have three growing daughters. I mess up constantly and worry that I am permanently, permanently jacking them up. We are all doing the best we can with what we have. And the great big family of God, we are called to help each other, sharpening one another by pointing each other back to the true word of God and encouraging one another in his truth. So. If I'm a child of God, then I am an ambassador of God. And with that comes the humility of being in need too. From this place of humility and need, my action is prayer for the need that I've seen and asking God for direction in what I should or could do in the situation that has arisen. And maybe it's nothing. Maybe I'm not the person God wants to use. Or maybe God wants me to hug my sister and simply tell her that she is a good mom. Maybe God is telling me to hand that person at the traffic light my bottle of cold water and the lunch that I just bought, or maybe he wants me to hand them my last $20 bill. In whatever case, God can and will direct your actions when you ask him. And you do not have to worry if it is the right thing to do because God's directions are always right. When we can recognize the log in our own eye, then we become sympathetic, empathetic to the speck in someone else's, and that changes how we react to them. This will lead us to that second nature of Jesus. Finally, the last verse, verse six. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Jesus is continuing to instruct us to keep on discerning his wisdom and then to share his good and trustworthy truth with others. We are to be in prayer with God each day, asking him for his discernment over the areas of our lives where we will be in contact with other people. There will be people in our paths who will receive what we have to share from God with frustration or anger and contempt, essentially not truly receiving it, but they'll be rejecting God's word. The dogs and pigs are often understood as those people who are hostile to wisdom 
that you've shared. And so they are hostile to God's kingdom. Side note for all you hashtag dog parents today, dogs were looked at very differently back in the day and than they are today. So they weren't taking selfies um, with their dogs. Just side note. The same instruction that Jesus gave his disciples when he sent them off to minister and share the good news in the villages applies here too. If the people in those villages rejected the message that Jesus sent with his disciples, then they were to shake off the dust from their sandals and move on to the next village with their message of hope. Our love for others must not blind us to their hardened rejection of the good news of the kingdom. The pearls that Jesus speaks of are godly correction, and the correction shouldn't be cast before those who are determined to not receive it. So verse 6 is a call for encouragement to pray each day for those people God will place in our paths. Pray for discernment for those he's already prepared to receive him who will not reject him. We may never see the end product of a person accepting God, Jesus as their savior. But you could be used as the planter of a seed or a waterer of the plant, and those jobs are vital. When we recognize the log in our eye, it may help us to remember a time where we couldn't be reasoned with. The way you can the person that is refusing wisdom is to avoid the fight and debate and simply pray for them and love them right where they are, even if that means that they reject the wisdom in that moment. But let's say that there are some here today who are all in. You've heard this. You believe that Jesus is the Messiah who came to earth to dwell with us, lived a sinless life and gave himself as a sacrifice for you. And then he rose again from the dead and is in heaven. If this is you, then allow me to lead us in a prayer and also to invite our Akuo community to join us in praying for you. Because as we all know here at Akuo, no one ever has to pray alone. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you sacrificed yourself for me and all of my sins in my past, the sins I'm struggling with now, and the sins in my future. I thank you for loving me, and I give you my life. I love you. Amen. I want to encourage all of us this week to ask Jesus, is there something about myself that I am not noticing? Is there something that is obvious to others around me that is affecting my ability to love you, God, and others well? Let's give a minute just to sit and listen. Let's pray. Father, thank you that like 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, thank you that you are our friend. And as we belong to you, you ask us hard things about ourselves and we can safely welcome them. Thank you for desiring to sharpen us and make our spirits healthy and strong. Please give us strength to let go of all the things that we need to let go of so that we can be more and more like your precious son, 
Jesus. Amen. All right, will y'all join me in thanking Des for a great message today. We super appreciate your time and your your effort and the way that you have carefully crafted that uh, to just show care for, for our people. We, we really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Des. Now, before we go, let me share a few things that we have going on here at Akuo. Well, we will be meeting up for our dinner groups once again. We will be hosting these meals in dining rooms across the area from July 21st through July 23rd. So if you're interested in attending one of these groups, we are allowing you guys to scan the QR code on the screen to see where you might fit best. But really, we want to encourage you to be at church next Sunday to get signed up in person so you know exactly where you're going to be going. Now, we are always thinking about how we are linking to the community, and right now we are in the middle of a backpack drive with Christian Assistance Ministry. What we are helping at families uh, that might not have the resources to purchase school supplies for the upcoming school year. So what we're doing is connecting with Cam, right? Cam is going to find these families, find these students, and what we're doing is adopting students and buying them a backpack filled with their school supplies. We have a wide range of ages all the way from pre-K through a senior in high school. And we have all the info that you need for those kids today. So if you want to be a part of this, reach out to me as soon as possible, right? Just hit me up, humby.sedvera at akuo.church, or you can call or text the church at 210-901-8785 so we can make sure that you have a kid to adopt in this thing. Now, each year, we also make sure that the organization of Akuo grabs a few of those bags as well. So you know that when you are generous here to Akuo, it goes towards things like this. Uh, us reaching out to the community, linking to them, and serving them in the best way possible. It goes towards things like us connecting with our community uh, at the Monticello Park Neighborhood Association for the July Kids Parade, right? We want to make sure that our talent, time, and treasure goes to our community. So when you are being generous to Akuo, I want you to know that you're not necessarily being generous to Akuo, but really what you're doing is being generous to your community through Akuo. And when it comes to giving here to Akuo, I want you to know I'm not hung up on the percentage. I just want you to be listening to God about what you should be giving. I want you to ask him what you should be giving and then that listen to that little voice, that random thought. That's what you should be doing. Not storing up as much treasure as possible, but leveraging everything you get to spread the kingdom of God. Now, if you aren't sure where to start, maybe you haven't heard from God yet. One of the many ways that you can express your generosity here at Akuo is through the biblical method of generosity called tithing. And all that means is just giving a first fruit, 10% offering to the storehouse, which is your local church. That could be where you start. But also, I totally understand that the celebration of giving might not be a possibility for you right now. Things might be really tough for you and your family. And if that's you, that's okay. If things are tough for you right now, please allow us to help you out. Allow us to be linked to you during your tough time. So if you need anything at all, please reach out to us. Or if you know someone that needs some help, go ahead and let us know. To do that, all you have to do is go to our website, akuo.church, and click on the Contact Us link. You can also send an email to us at help at akuo.church. And you can call or text the church at 210-901-8785. Now, if you're willing to give here to Kubo Church, the way you can do that is by going to our website, akuo.church. When you get there, all you have to do is click on the giving link and follow the instructions that you see on the screen. We also have our text to give option. For that, all you have to do is text akuo, A-K-O-U-O, and the dollar amount you want to give to the number 77977. If you don't want to give electronically, we totally understand that. We also have a PO box available for you if you'd like to send your gift through a check. For that, all you have to do is mail it to akuo, at P.O. Box 100-125, San Antonio, Texas, 78201. All right, guys, that's all that I have for you today. I just want you to know that I love and appreciate all of you, and me and the Akuo team will be praying for you all week long. Now, before we go, let me just pray over you one last time. So, Jesus, I thank you for today. I thank you for the folks that got a chance to listen in on this. I pray that as they leave, that they would remember the logs that they have in their own eyes. I pray that they would remember the things that they are dealing with. And I pray that through that understanding of who they are, that they would extend the same grace that they get to all the people around them, especially the ones that they see specks in their eyes and, and all that. Lord, I pray that you would show them how to love people that are on the other side of things from them. Jesus, I thank you for everything that you've given to us. We love you. 
And we pray all these things in your name. Amen. All right, that's all that I have for you this week. We'll see you next time. Thank you.